Welcome to the Practice Podcast, conversations probing the nature of practice. I'm your host, Dave Piron. This is a conversation with Rob Larity, who has founded a company called Cognitive Investments. I thought that name was quite intriguing, and so I wanted to know a lot more. And you will hear what I've learned, and I am excited for the future of this new company, basically just opening its doors as an investment firm to, in quotes, outsiders like us, <laughs> uh, so uh, they can put uh, our money uh, to work in what I think is a very different way. And what my opinion is doesn't matter. It's what you hear from Rob and whether you like what he's saying. I think you will. But I'm most interested in Rob himself. This is an incredible story of someone who way back in 2015 thought, I don't want to keep on seeing investments going this way for people I know and care about. I think there's a better way. And then over the last seven, almost eight years, he and then the people who collaborated with him have built this model, this new business model for investing. And he still looks awfully young to me. <laughs> so I think he'll be with this model for a long time, decades and decades ahead, because that's their intention is to grow this business as a boutique company with care and enjoy the hell out of the learning and the results. So here is Rob Larity. This is going to be a whole other learning experience for me, folks. I, I hope it is for you, and I, I hope it is for Rob Larity as well. He's the founder and chief investment officer of Cognitive Investments. And when I saw that title, Cognitive Investments, I thought, well, isn't that what we're always doing when we're learning? <laughs> aren't, we, aren't we creating a, a good stock of knowledge in the world? And uh, But I think it has to do more with money and certainly learning. So, Rob, it was great to have you here. Uh, let's start with the, the title of the company, Cognitive Investments. That's kind of cool. How did you come up with that? Well, the, the real story is we were doing some experiments with using uh, certain tools for measuring physiological indicators of uh, your body and brain mm -hmm. and incorporating them into how do we use that to make good judgments at the right time. So when you're not too stressed, when you're going to make sound gut decisions about things, and that was the initial impetus but we don't that's not a big part of what we do it's just uh something kind of neat that uh started us up, started us off oh i like it i i i like the connection we can all make to that analogy that we uh essentially mass manage our own growth and development through our cognitive abilities and uh uh once we have an idea of the discipline that takes and the uh, humility as well as the eagerness to learn comes together and you've got a, a, a smarter person. Now we're talking about a smart company. Uh, well, when did cognitive investments come into being? So the initial seed of the company was planted as far back as 2015. Hmm. Um, we became registered and started officially operating in late 2020 and we've only recently in the last six weeks or so opened up to outside clients uh, previously we were just managing money for people that we knew people within our existing network so we're quite new if you uh, take the end part of that timeline but it's been in the works for a very long time and being designed for a very long time. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, do you remember when that first uh, seed came to your mind, Rob, as the founder, uh, what, back uh, almost six years ago, six years ago? 
and uh, seven years ago. Man, I, I'm glad I'm not doing investment planning because my mathematics skills are going <laughs> out the door here. So uh, what, what about that first seed? What was the, uh, the impulse that made you want to try this very different, I assume, very different kind of company? Sure. Well, I would imagine that it's a similar impulse to what drives a lot of your listeners and your guests who are starting new businesses, which is mm -hmm. a, dis a dissatisfaction with what exists. Yep. And the, the, the difficult thing and the great thing about what we do is that there are literally tens of thousands of other firms, other financial advisors that work with individual people. So there's a lot of competition. I guess. But, yeah. But the the common denominator across all of them is that they're very commoditized. It's very much like lawyers. Um, how do you choose a financial advisor? It's much like the way you would choose a lawyer. Someone tells you about them, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Hey, I know a guy. Mm -hmm. I work with this guy. He's okay. Or this woman, she's okay. Yeah. Um, there's very little differentiation based on business model or the experience that someone has. Um, we had a, a meeting just a few days ago with a prospective client who's interested in signing up with us. And this person was so excited to hear about our model and sort of how we do things. And they said, you know, I had meetings with four other financial advisors and it was very pleasant, very nice. They were very polished, but it was the same meeting every time. Hmm. Um, so I, I think recognizing that stasis in the way that things are currently done um, caused us to see that there was an opportunity to really try to design something that's truly different. Yeah. And yet you didn't rush right into a slam bang. Here we are, 2016, I'm back, you know, we're trying it out. You, you've given it a lot of time and thought with, uh, I'm, I'm sure your, your co co-developers and teammates, but I, uh, just it would be helpful to me for sure uh, to get more crystallized view of why that person was excited about what you offered in, in the way it was different than the norm, the usual. What, what do you think was one or two of the features of your approach that, that made that person really smile? Yeah, and I, I would like to talk about kind of the length of time in designing because I think it's relevant yeah. in terms of practice and a lot of the things that you uh, focus on mm -hmm. um, and, and building things over time. Uh, but to answer the question about what got this, uh, this woman excited, I think there's really three elements. Um, there's a lot of things, but we like to generalize and say there's three elements that we focus on doing differently. Um, the first is uh, pursuing an investment strategy for our clients and building a strategy for them that's very active and thoughtful and long-term oriented and seizing opportunities, not just, you know, I, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, the way financial advisors work, but typically, they will do what's called a passive strategy, which means just put your money in the market and hold your hand. And, you know, basically, when things go to hell in a handbasket, to call you up and say, well, you know, no one could have seen that coming, just stay the course and those sorts yeah. of things. I mean, that's uh, how not the a model happy usually works. <laughs> not, a, not a happy phone call, mm. uh, indeed. Whereas we, uh, rather than focus on sort of the handholding part and ignore the actual investing, which is what someone is, is paying an advisor for. We're back, we're, our background is investing. Our specialization is in investing. And we devote a massive amount of thought and time and resources into being very careful and thoughtful and long-term oriented about the investing. Mm -hmm. So just one example of that, we have a whole geopolitical arm uh, uh one of our partners just focuses on geopolitical analysis to understand what's happening you know with china with russia with europe 
from a very big picture perspective and how that impacts not only our clients' international investments, which everyone who is invested in the market has international exposure, whether they like it or not, mm -hmm. but also the U.S. investments. And uh, the events of the last few years have shown just how important that is because you can't escape those things. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that, the sort of depth and thoughtfulness um, is a big differentiator. The second thing that's different is we have a service that we call human wealth, um, which is where we take sort of a more holistic view of our clients' wealth. And it's not just the wealth that's in their bank account that we're managing for them, but it's also viewing them as someone with inherent potential. So mm. our services are particularly attractive to people who are running businesses, who are entrepreneurs, who own businesses, they have family assets, that sort of thing. They're doing stuff. And what we do is we put all of our research and network and connections to work to try to help them do what they do better. Oh, that's very unique in my experience. Yeah. Mm. So, um, for example, we have, uh, in the case of this person that I was speaking with, the woman that I mentioned earlier, uh, she has a startup, uh, a startup that does consulting and technology. They have a technology uh, product that they provide to businesses to help manage the mental health of their employees. Mm. So we've started doing some work with her on her business model, identifying potential uh, flaws in the business model that we are familiar with through our research in other areas. Mm -hmm. shaping you know how she's going to build the business um that's what we focus on and no one really does that oh, so I don't, um, I don't think so i think that's that's great i mean the more that it succeeds the more wealth she will have uh to put into investments and then yeah. everybody everyone's happy <laughs> yeah that's exactly the idea um and the third thing which ties into the other two is you know, part of the problem with the traditional financial advisor model is it relies on sort of the Wizard of Oz effect to some extent. And what I mean by that is this notion of, okay, Dave, you don't know anything about investing. So give me all your money and I'm going to go, you know, put it in some strategy for you. And I'm not going to tell you anything about what's going on. And maybe every six months we'll have a meeting and I'll you know, explain some things to you and say, we're going to do this and that. Um, but there's this distance, this presumed authority. And, um, mm. and there's a, a, it's like an auto mechanic. You don't know what's going on under the hood, but they <laughs> just say, you know, trust us and we're going to take good care of you. And often that's not the case. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a growing dissatisfaction with that. Yeah, uh, especially in, in many sectors, as you know, yeah. the, the the bigness of things has uh, from, you know, I'm an old guy talking, but it's pretty much removed the, the local, I know you and you know me aspect of life, which I'm hearing you are recreating in your business. Yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off yeah. on that third one. Let's, let's hear the third one. <laughs> no, but that's, a, that's absolutely right. And, and there's a, I think, the the internet the amount of information that people have at their disposal the power of the tools that they have at their disposal um it that old system doesn't work anymore the old authority based you know just shut up and trust me system mm -hmm. so what we very deliberately try to do is we like we are the experts like we've spent 20 years studying and working and training you know on the issue of practice to do what we do well and we don't downplay that but at the same time what we do is we make it completely transparent to the client and we engage and involve the client in what we're doing which means we show them here's every thing that we're doing on your behalf you know i said we do active strategies here's every decision that we're making and here's why we're making it and here's the criteria that we set ahead of time to determine if that's not the right decision and if we have to change so it's 
it's acknowledging the messiness of life and the messiness of dealing with complex systems because it's not easy. Um, and anyone who tells you it is, is, is being dishonest. Um, and I think certain people, you know, uh, that's TMI for them. But I think there's the, the response that we've gotten, at least, has been extremely positive and sort of a, this refreshing notion of, I finally feel like someone's being honest with me, that someone's laying it out in front of me. And, and we can do that in a way that doesn't, doesn't presume that the client is going to be the expert, but it's giving them access to things that previously were, you know, off in the back room and, oh, don't ask about this, where, you know, we have the green lamp and the mahogany desk and you stay on that side of the desk and we're on this side. And, um, that's, that's just not tenable anymore with, yeah. uh, with the way things are with technology. You've talked about several of the people, indirectly talked about several of the people who work with you, and perhaps this goes back to your request to talk about the length of time it, it's, it's still taking to bring this business uh, up to the level where you, where you feel it's fully open. So uh, what, during that time, was it you and one other person, or how did you grow yourself in the relationships you needed and still need to, to get the most uh, robust <laughs> forward motion? Sure. So the nice thing about what we do is uh, everyone who's currently part of the team, with a few exceptions, previously worked and continues to work together at an existing business called Off Wall Street, which is one of the leading consultants to hedge funds in the world. Um, and uh, I am still uh, a partner and director of research at Off Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So Cognitive is a business that we built to take all of the deep research, all of the knowledge and know-how that we developed over the years at Off Wall Street, and instead of putting it to work for just hedge funds, making it available to benefit individual people. Wow. Um, so the benefit of that is that we could afford to do things the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, because we, you know, the wolf was not at the door. We weren't burning cash flow even from day one. So we were able to slowly start with a few of the core people and build it out more and more. And now we have a full investment team. We have uh, Jacob, who's our uh, geopolitical director. We have a chief operating officer, a marketing uh, officer, and all without, you know, burning a lot of cash without taking a lot of business risk and being very deliberate about it. Um, and I, I think that's a, it's an important lesson if I could impart anything from creating a business to your listeners or people who may be on the entrepreneurial side of things, it would be, there's this romantic notion of startups and, and creating businesses, whether it's a, you know, high technology business with a lot of technology risk, or whether it's a restaurant or anything mm -hmm. that has a clearly established business model, and you know mm -hmm. it's more traditional. But there's this notion that you're you're swinging for the fences and you're taking these big risks and you're a gunslinger, and that's just completely wrong. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. if you look at if you look at some of the most successful entrepreneurs over time, like Bill Gates when he started Microsoft. You, he had an extremely well-calibrated risk-reward that he had laid out there. He had backup plans. He had cash flow. And, and the people who make it are the people who set that up where you get many, many shots on goal. Um, inevitably, when there's something that goes wrong in the early stages, operationally or otherwise, you have the durability to, to be fine and to continue. Um, and that's an important aspect of what we built and why we're going to be around for a very long time i hope well i get it and uh each um going uh carefully like you have over these years recognizing that debt you do not want to create unnecessary debt means that you have lived underlined lived the careful experience that investors now looking at 
your company would want to know. They'd want to know, Rob, what are you and your colleagues like as as people? I think that's that's the key, because as, as you say, most of the people who uh, have shingles out as financial advisors have, are very likable people, and we can't say they aren't trustworthy to the extent that they can be. But it does matter a lot who you are. And uh, just a little bit of your biography might help us get a picture for that. Uh, my, my impression of you is that you are wonderfully clear in your, not only your thought, but how you express yourself. And I suspect that that probably is because you went to my alma mater, Colby College, right? No, I went to Holy Cross. Oh, I could have sworn. <laughs> I could have sworn you were a Colby guy because you're so smart and articulate. Uh, uh, good, good recovery, Dave. <laughs> but when you were at Holy Cross, <laughs> uh, is that when you were planning to get into uh, supporting hedge funds and, and, and being in this wicked world of finance? No, not at all. I didn't know anything about finance when I was at Holy Cross. I was a classics and an English literature uh, major and a computer science minor, hmm. uh, the latter of which I did because I figured it might help me actually get a job after school, which was <laughs> turned out to be a, a good a good decision. A good decision, yeah. Um, it is a classics major. Does, is there something that you still feel now has uh, given you of uh, this unique and different way of building a business that may have been cultivated back there at uh, Colby? I mean, Holy Cross. <laughs> I don't know if it's about classics or English or anything in particular, but I think one really important aspect of that background in what I do today is just the notion of curiosity mm. and being wide ranging in one's interests. And I've discovered um, the most successful people in finance and investing tend to be from those, you know, I'm making air quotes, weird backgrounds. Yeah, the liberal arts, not business, not a business school? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think the reason for that is, um, so, so my boss for many, many years, a gentleman named Mark Roberts, who is one of the best short sellers ever. That's, you know, what Off Wall Street was famous for. So contrarian, really deep research, seeing things completely differently. You know, Mark disclosed the Enron fraud, but that's how Off Wall Street became famous oh, wow. um, and, and uncovered what was going on there and could see what was going on there. And, you know, Mark was not a finance guy. Mark had a master's degree in French literature. Um, so he was reading Maya May and, you know, uh, uh, I think he did a whole wide range of things before he ever became involved in investments. And that's a very common theme. That's been my own experience, which is our success. And, and this is getting to um, what I was saying before about seeing the flaws in the way that things are currently being done in the, in the current system. I think having that ability to step out of the mental models of whatever industry you're in, um, and just see things a little differently, question the assumptions that go into any business model or story that's being told about, you know, here's how we do things. Um, that's a huge advantage, and especially in investments, because we deal in what's effectively a zero-sum game. The way to perform really well investing is to be different. You know, as Warren Buffett says, when everyone is is feeling greedy, you need to be fearful and, and vice versa. When everyone else is panicking, you know, when there's blood in the streets, that's when you should be getting aggressive and excited. And that's very easy to say, and it's very difficult to do. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. If you don't have that breadth of uh, knowledge and point of view to step out of, uh, of that box a little bit. So I think that's really the thing that mm. that is most important. And it's the aspect that I notice with the people that I 
have brought to work with me mm-hmm. is sort of this wide ranging, endless curiosity, this, this tendency to practice as, as you would say, but to practice by, you know, not just playing the same notes over and over, but by exploring different things all the time. And that's sort of the fuel that keeps them going. You know, just for example, one of my partners at Cognitive, Jacob, the uh, director of geopolitical analysis, as I mentioned, he uh, has a religion, religious studies background. He went to Cornell and studied Arabic. And, uh, you know, he's so, so that's the common theme is um, this sort of generalist mindset, getting out, um, and being able to be a little more nimble uh, to see where those opportunities are. Oh, I think that's a great formula. Yeah, when you uh, when you do uh, collaborate as a team, um, how does that how is that done? I assume pretty much virtually, even though I think you're located up in Boston. Is that your nowadays? Who's located anywhere? <laughs> You're located where you can get a hold of a camera and a, and a microphone. Yeah, but that's uh, right. when you do collaborate, and how does that go? Give us, give us a sample, because it seems to me with all those different minds and outlooks, points of view, uh, that you know, a quick meeting would be if everyone thought alike and you were just reading a, a, a string of numbers and, or reading something that came crunched out of a big data search. Uh, it doesn't sound like that's what your meetings are about. So how do you go with your meetings? How do your meetings tend to work? Sure. Well, we have uh, on the geographic front, you're right. So I'm in Cambridge, Mass. So I'm in Kendall Square, which is where our main office is. Mm-hmm. And some some of the other people work here with me. But we have uh, two guys in Los Angeles, one guy in New Orleans. Uh, we have a guy who spends a lot of his time in Texas you know, we're, we're all over the place. So I'm sure a lot of people are dealing with this collaboration Mm -hmm. is um, something that needs to be approached very thoughtfully. Yes. So the way that we work together, and it's a little tricky because what we do is a little different from other listeners who may be operating in more traditional businesses that aren't investment businesses because um, there is no democracy in in what we do. At the end of the day, there needs to be a decision maker with responsibility for what gets done. Yeah. And, th- and that's me. Yeah. But at the same time, we have this team of people of extremely intelligent and thoughtful people with different kind of areas of interest, different ways to approach problems so there's always that balance between having it be an open forum and and the way that i handle this and uh, i'm still trying to perfect this is um when we have team meetings i try not to speak as much as i can help it i try to let that's tough (laughs) <laughs> it is but all those bright people and you're bright too and you know, like your mind's probably firing about fifty thousand times a second and there you go but, but um, otherwise why have them if you're the guy who's going to make the call literally to what to to buy or sell if you were simply had them on the phone and then you were doing all the talking it would be a disaster well let me tell you let me bring you through a very specific example okay so the delicacy in managing a team and what we do is that, as I said, we're taking active steps on behalf of our clients to, uh, to make moves that are difficult by definition. Mm-hmm. So if you were to go back to early June, uh, the market, I don't know how closely you follow the stock market, the market was in, was in a very bad state. Yes, it was. Yeah. And um, we internally, we were seeing signs that things were looking at putting in a bottom. And the difficulty or the delicacy of what we do is that that's a very difficult decision to make. And ultimately, what we did was we went in and we started, you know, making more investments, buying more for our clients, anticipating that this would happen. 
And and that is indeed how it turned out. And obviously, we're not always right, but this is one case where we were. But the tricky thing is, it's hard to, you can't make decisions as a consensus all the time, because the consensus, you're always trying to be a little bit ahead of that consensus. And this is a difficult concept to explain. But if you just follow what the consensual view is on the market at any time, you're going to be the market. So the balance is between taking non-consensual views, non, you know, uh, contrarian views from what everyone in Barron's and the Wall Street Journal is writing about and all the people on TV, and yet having the humility to check them and to ground them in what's actually successful. Because you can't just be a crank. You can't just be a knee-jerk contrarian and say, oh, well, they're all you know, buying, so I'm going to sell no. because that's, that's, that's not a recipe for success either. Not with other people's money. <laughs> exactly. You throw your money around if you want, but not, yeah. not, not to your clients. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's just as thoughtless as just mindlessly following what everyone does. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to have that group dynamic where people are challenging each other, challenging ideas, presenting new information and doing so in a way that's completely loose and open and non-threatening but then at the same time you need to shape that in a direction that some people may not uh, agree with and i don't know uh if this is just the caliber of the people that we brought together or if it's the relatively small size of the group because we're a boutique firm and we're always going to remain one we'll never have some huge committee to please um, but generally speaking, we tend to see similarly the opportunities to zig when others are zagging and, and, and vice versa. So, so far, we've done a very good job of balancing that. But that's the tricky, the yeah, tricky and you, thing. And you do it every day. It's not yeah. like you can do it and it's done and then you can go, okay, let's all go see in a few weeks. It seems to me, since every morning I wake up, I, I see the market's doing this, that, the other thing, it's, it's never, never sleep, never, never sleep, that no. you have to be on point together um, quite regularly. So here's the personal question. Uh, how do you relax? How do you enjoy other aspects of your life with that much responsibility to be the guy who takes all that input from your team, but then says, no, this is what we're going to do. And as soon as you do it, you know, things change and you have to uh, quickly uh, recover if, if it's a loss or celebrate a game, but you are, you're always in motion. So I assume then not only did you choose not to go to Kobe, but you never sleep and you have no life. Is that also true? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a very good question and I think uh, there's a few different aspects to explore there um, a lot of people burn out yeah. um, because you know and, and you see this often with highly intelligent overachievers so a lot of the people in my world are the sort of people who've never done any wrong they, you know, went straight from Princeton to Harvard MBA to yeah. McKinsey yeah. to JP Morgan to managing some big hedge fund. Yeah. And the whole time they've just never stopped. And the problem is that in that traditional kind of uh, highly accomplished route, there's often never the opportunity to develop a sense of self um, and a sense of balance and a sense of knowing, you know, that every decision doesn't always work out. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, the, the key thing to being a great investor or to doing what we do successfully over time is not to be more intelligent than everyone else. Um, that's really hard and it's not a sustainable approach because there's always extremely smart people everywhere you go. Absolutely. It's about having the self-control and the emotional discipline to make sound decisions uh, under pressure and to recognize that it's a, it's a game of averages. 
um, you know, the, a, a crazy statistic. If you were to look at someone like George Soros, for instance, who's mm-hmm. probably the greatest, you know, investor by track record ever, you know, George Soros was only right about 30 to 40% of the time. And yet he got a a few billion bucks to to live on. Exactly. In his old age. (laughs) Yeah. So you need to have that that self-awareness, that emotional discipline to know that it's about the process that goes into it. Uh, Just like an athlete. An athlete goes and they practice every day. They practice, you know, creating and and building the muscle memory to Mm -hmm. do the right motions. And, and oftentimes they go through streaks, you know, the outcome is, is only loosely tethered to the inputs, but over time it will move with the inputs. Yeah. So you need to have the balance to say, okay, my inputs are sound and it's going to fluctuate around that. And that's where you get your sanity and you're not up at two in the morning watching the, you know, Japanese markets trading and saying, oh my God, you know, is, is this all falling <laughs> apart? Um, <laughs> Well, no, that's a great answer. To, so you actually do have some fun and and maybe get to go outside your building and walk around Cambridge a little bit, get a, get a coffee. <laughs> well, it, it, we, I think we have the best life, frankly, and I'm biased. But essentially, because what we do is very long-term oriented, but it's also very deep and thoughtful, essentially what we do is we just read all day long, you know, we we watch the markets for probably 30 or 45 minutes a day just to understand and watch how are things responding to other mm-hmm. things, you know, the, uh, get a feel for what's happening. But most things, it's a library-like environment. It's very calm. It's going really deep into certain topics or, or subjects or technologies. Like th- this week, we're spending a lot of time looking into the Chinese property markets and, and reading books about Chinese uh, shadow banking and, um, you know, the, the, those sorts of issues. And then at the other half of the week, we're, we're working on uh, artificial intelligence models and how that's changing uh, the way that images are created and how that might impact things. So that's it's, it's, I mean, I tell you, I got to break in. I, that to me would be uh, about as wonderful a life as a person who enjoys not only their own ideas, but the published and spoken ideas of other could have in part, because it's not reading for reading sake. It, it, you always have the notion, not the notion, you always know that something you're going to derive from that reading is going to come to into play spontaneously or you've got it already a note ready to share. And so it gets put to use and then you get feedback. You get an amazing feedback because you know, the numbers go up or the numbers go down. So it's like the perfect... Uh, wheel of uh, of a career and i suspect that uh, there are a lot of particularly younger people who uh you know have looked at that model of going you know through the selective school and then onto the mba and and trying to get into that knot hole to to eventually the dream of being a partner what i'm picking up in my trend watches and since i've worked with young people my whole career is that that's not what they want that they're willing to have less income and more life experience underlying experience and they want to feel like they're exercising their total wit if you will not just do this and then the rest they can do recreationally but to put it all on the table every day. So I, I suspect to be people hear this podcast will be going, how do I go to work for for cognitive investments? How, how about how do I get to meet this guy Rob? And my answer is uh, just come up to Cambridge, walk down the street. If you see a nice looking gentleman whose head's buried in a book and he's got a coffee in one hand and a glass of water in the other, that's him. Ask him for a job. 
<laughs> <laughs> but remember what he said he's not trying to go big on this firm it may not be more than one or two more people who join him over time uh because overhead and the loss of that cohesion that i hear about that seems to be extremely um beneficial to to your business model so i have to call the time on this rob i want to keep going and perhaps we could get uh, a, another chapter on this as the business grows it's what open to outside investors what tw how many days did you say just 20 just since the beginning of june Mm -hmm. Prior to that, we were just making everything yeah. right and perfect and making sure it worked perfectly. This is an exciting time to be meeting you. And uh, uh, I will well, tip thanks. off I will tip off why I know Rob. <laughs> uh Rob's sister, Kristen uh Gallagher, is just a wonderful person who's married to one of my very best friends. And frankly, Rob, isn't this how it works in a way? I know people who know people. Kristen said, well, I know Doc Ferron is doing this podcast. And you and I met with her last week. And it sounded like you thought maybe this would be a good experience for you personally and for the business. And yeah, I hope you sure. agree. I've had a wonderful time. I certainly do. And if anyone is interested in following what we're doing, if you're interested in the topics that we discussed, we have our own podcast, which is called the Cognitive Dissidence Podcast. It's hosted by uh, my colleague Jacob, in which we talk about geopolitical subjects, investing, markets, Chinese shadow banking, AI, you know, uh, everything under the sun. Uh, and if you want to go to our website, there's also a free newsletter that we put out, which is just a little taste of all of the research and thinking that we're doing. But it's a summary of everything that's happened that week uh, geopolitically from a big picture of perspective and what it means, how to interpret it. So those are two ways that you can engage with us in the future if you're interested. All right. I, if I hadn't budgeted all my time to listen to my podcast and old <laughs> episodes of my podcast, I might go over there and listen to yours. No, I, I think, folks, there's plenty of time in your life to listen to both. Uh, and uh, if you just just mine and uh, that one, uh, life's going to be a whole lot better for you all. It's just oh. not, it's just going to be a better life. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Sounds good. Dude. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Practice Podcast, where we discuss practice with a capital P. If you'd like to hear more, listen in on Spotify, Automatic. Apple Podcasts or go to inactionresearch.com slash podcast dash page. And if you'd like to learn more about social inaction and the nature of practice, head over to inactionresearch.com for more information. Thank you for supporting this show. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Oh, and, and one more thing. How could I forget the book? on practice as a way of being is available now in digital form something that would be new like podcasting to many of us and it's a, a great way of learning more and more about what this podcast presented when peter vale and i originated it several years ago so please come to www my library one word dot world slash practice and you'll see what i mean thank you